Welcome to the Private Investors Podcast, the podcast where keen stock pickers Mark Atkinson and Maynard Payton talk about managing their share portfolios. Mark began buying shares in 1984 when I started in 1993. This time we cover Fundsmith and the investment potential of Terry Smith. Let's get started. Mark, a slightly different podcast this time because you are currently in Mauritius. So how was your holiday? Yeah, week six of six, Maynard. So it's been fantastic, but a little bit of a heavy heart because I think just in a few days, I'll be joining you back in the UK where I think the weather has been a, not quite as clement, shall we say. Yes, it's been freezing back in Britain. But when I think of Mauritius, I think of sandy beaches, cocktails by the swimming pool and Terry Smith, because he lives out there, doesn't he? So have you bumped into Terry yet in a local bar? Not yet, no. I believe amongst his many pastimes, he's a keen cyclist. And when I've been out, either running or walking, I'm seeing him going whizzing past me, but it would be a, would be actually fantastic to meet with Terry and have a bit of chat with him. I think it would be a fascinating conversation. Certainly from my point of view, he'd probably be bored to tears, but I don't know what the etiquette would be if I was introduced to him, whether it would be to shake hands, to bow or to curtsy, because I would describe him as investing royalty. Yes, that's a good description, I think. So Terry Smith, of course, runs Fundsmith and you own some Fundsmith shares. So tell me about your investment in Fundsmith because it's done really well, hasn't it, for you? Yeah, it has. The genesis of the funds that I've got in Fundsmith. When I started investing back when I was 18, I was running my own portfolio. And then alongside that, I started investing in some funds doing the old direct debit, pound cost averaging, and they were in Schroeder funds. I think it was about three or four funds. And that was to give me some extra scope. So spread my risk a little bit. And those were in things like US smaller companies and Far East and those kind of things. I did it very well over a long period of time, perhaps 15 or 20 years. But then I came to the realization that I'd done better than they had. So I halted those payments in, into Schroeder. I did my own thing and expanded my own portfolio. I, I in effect, came, became my own fund manager and just left the, the Schroeder funds there for several years. And then eventually was, was tempted to, to move those monies across into Fundsmith in April 2014. The fund was launched in 2010 at one, a price of 100. And in 2014, I got it in at 16464, 164.64. So I thought I'd missed a little bit of the action, but as you can see on the performance, it touched, I think in December 2021, 670. There's been some of a pullback. It's around in the 570s, but I'm more than satisfied with that performance. It's done really well for you, hasn't it? And it's turbocharged your wealth, hasn't it, I think? Yeah, it has. Because when you look at the funds that, that I did put into to Fundsmith, there's quite a weight of money there, really, to be honest. And that really turbocharged my whole portfolio, my, my net wealth, and was something of a life-changing experience. When you've got a, a conviction planned by a, a, an excellent performance, that can make a big difference. Life-changing sounds intriguing. So what changed in your life then from this Fundsmith? It's not, it's not as though everything changed overnight. I think you and I have been doing this enough years to see that our lives would have taken a different journey, but it's done over, you can't necessarily see it day to day. Those dividends come in that you keep reinvesting. And when I started work at 17 and I never wanted to be working till 60, you know, I'm going to work till I'm 65. It was not even that. Now it's going to 67 and 68. By the time I got through to my thirties, I could see the benefits of what I'd done, that I wasn't going to have to go that kind of distance. But given the performance of Fundsmith, that real kind of catapult late in the day allowed me to just pack up work and do what I want to do. That's basically, and that's been very liberating. You have to be able to do that at 53 and still be physically active to do the things that I want to do, I think has been a great gift. So it fun helped you retire early. That's what you're saying. Yeah. Looking back, as I look back now in hindsight, I had enough run in cricketing terms, I had enough runs on the board, but in the Fundsmith performance at that time, that really gave me that confidence to say, I'm, I'm well over the line. There were no doubts there that I could cross the Rubicon. In hindsight, I could have done it a few years earlier on, but it's one of those, is there any turning back? That's the thing. If you make that decision, it's a bold decision. It's a decision that I'm glad I've taken. And that's all through some canny investing in funds. This wasn't a, an obscure fund. This was a well-known fund and you put in, seems like a sizable amount of money and mm. it allowed you to retire early. That's the power of investing, isn't it? Compounding well, your money, building up net wealth. So you can perhaps have flexibility in your life to do things you want to do rather than work until you're very old. So yeah. Fundsmith makes up a big proportion of your wealth then, is that right? Yeah, this is a, like a kind of bit of a cards on the table question. The current situation is that as it stands, the portfolio that I manage is 
33% of my liquid wealth. Fundsmith accounts for 40%. And when wow. I turned 50, well, yeah, when I turned 55, I coalesced all those pensions that I accrued at various companies and they are all in uh, tracker funds. So Fundsmith has done really well. So when it launched, you said it was a pound per share. It's now five pound 50, five pound 60. So it's, I think it's, it's about 570. It's 570 now. So that turns yeah. out to be a, a 16% compound average growth rate yeah. i've looked through i've looked through some of the numbers and it has benefited from two things there's the re-rating effect of the shares that terry smith owns in the fund and also currency benefits so when the fund back in 2011 was one year old at the time it had a free cash flow yield of 5.8 percent so the market was paying about i think 17 times cash flow of the companies that were in the fund at the time that's now 28 times so that re-rating effect of those shares has bolstered the fund's net asset value. Also with Terry buying a lot of American shares, he's benefited from the strength of the US dollar and that's converted into higher net asset value for UK investors in pounds. So there's an interesting chart on Sharepad which compares the US version of the fund to the UK version and the US version denom denominated in dollars is up 100% over the last seven years and the UK version denominated in pounds is up 150%. So he's had this massive US dollar tailwind to the fund, which has helped the UK returns. So I think if you strip that out, the re-rating and the currency, you get from the 16% down to 8% growth, which is in line with what Terry said earlier on this year. He talked about annualized free cash flow growth in the fund of 8%, which is not far off the historic rate. I think the point I'm trying to make here is that I wouldn't go extrapolating the past growth of the fund, the 16%, because you can't guarantee the currency benefits and the re-rating benefits that you've seen over the last 10 years over the next 10 years. So 8%, I think, may be a more realistic growth rate of the fund. So would you be happy with 8% now, Mark? The yes, yeah, more than happy. Where I, where I am in, in my life, he's defending my current position. This is, I've got to a stage in a lifestyle that it's a, I'm trying to, if I can just keep this going, then I'm more than happy and that will keep me on this journey. The fund is still rated quite highly, I think. I don't think it's an obvious bargain. So if you, the cash flow from the companies are growing at 8% a year, I think it's valued at 28 times cash flow which is not an obvious bargain, but the companies it holds are top quality stuff, aren't they? Absolutely. So top 10 holdings from a recent fact sheet, Microsoft, Novo Nordisk, Philip Morris, L'Oreal, Idex Labs, Automatic Data Processing, Stryker, Estee Lauder, LVMH and McCormick. So I looked on SharePad and the average margin from those 10 shares is 27%. The lowest one is 17%. So they've all got some sort of competitive moat here where they can charge a lot of money and make a lot of money in terms of converting revenue to profit. So three of those shares, Microsoft, Novo Nordisk and Philip Morris have 40% margins. Yeah. So I've heard of, of that. They've got very defensive qualities as well, haven't they? Yeah. Yeah. So I've heard of Microsoft, Philip Morris have heard of. Do you know anything about Novo Nordisk? and it's 40% margin. Do you know what they do? Yeah, this is a company that probably not a household name like some of the other ones that you've just trotted out. And it's listed on the Danish stock market. It's, and that's another stock market that a lot of people usually think about. It's a small country, Denmark, with under 6 million people. And in terms of GDP, according to the IMF, it's the 41st biggest economy, sandwiched between the Philippines and Pakistan. But when it comes down to per capita, GDP per capita, it's 10. Now, Novo Nordisk is the biggest company in Denmark. It's got a capitalization of $305 billion, and that's the number one. The second largest company is a power company called Orsted in Denmark, and that's got a capitalization of $40 billion. So this is a Goliath for Denmark, this uh, Novo Nordisk, and uh, they are manufacturers of insulin. I think they have a huge market share. I think they sell... Is it half the insulin in the world? They've got 50% market share of, yeah. They've got the largest market share. The top three players, which are Novo Nordisk, I think it's Sanofi and Eli Lilly, account for 90% of the market. Just going back to that market capitalization of, you know, how big Novo Nordisk is at $305 billion. Shell, which is the UK's largest company, that's valued at $195 billion. So it's bigger than Shell. So Terry Smith has three tenants as such. He likes to buy quality companies, 
tries not to overpay and does nothing. Do you like Terry Smith's approach of actually not doing anything? Yeah, that is a, a drag on performance. And as you said at previous annual shareholder meetings, he's paid for performance, not activity. And that's something I can certainly buy into. It's end product, isn't it? That's what he's paid for. You see these fund managers are, are churning their portfolios constantly. He picks some good companies and just sticks with them and runs his winners. Yeah. So I, I mean, think it's a, an excellent strategy. I mean, he does talk about trading costs in his annual letters every year and he doesn't make brokers rich. So he's true to his word on that point. I mean, looking through his annual letters, I mean, he holds 25 to 30 shares and I think most years he sells five or less or top slices five or less. So he's not, yeah. he's not trading his shares. It's interesting to see why he sells when he does sell. And a lot of the time he talks about questionable management strategy. So the other year he talked about 3M. And he sold those because of growing doubts about the current management's capital allocation decisions. Colgate Palmolive, we grew tired of waiting for an effective growth strategy. Nestle, he sold, which was interesting because I thought Nestle is a textbook Terry Smith stock, but he sold this because of management of our companies. We rely on management of our companies to allocate capital in ways which create value for us as investors. And he didn't think they were doing that with this deal with Starbucks. Sometimes he gets involved in these companies, but he doesn't like how management works, which is interesting yeah. actually, because Unilever, he's not happy with Unilever management, trying to buy parts of Glaxo, and yet he's kept on to Unilever. There's a guy called Nelson Peltz, who is, uh, who's come onto the board, hasn't he? Perhaps he's waiting for him to shake things up a little bit. Yeah. So maybe he's, he's mellowed a little bit with management. I think with Unilever, you said that the, the brands at Unilever will outlast the board. So maybe he's mellowed a little bit and hopes the management will change. So in terms of, uh, in terms of his selling, he hasn't done much selling. So he's been true to his mm, word on that point. Yeah. You mentioned Colgate as well. I think it, it had drifted to below. I think he was waiting for things to turn around a little bit and the stake had gone to below 1% of the portfolio. And he said it was taking up a valuable space. It, was, it wasn't going to use that phrase, move the needle. So he decided to get rid of it yeah, and find another candidate. He's done that in the past with McDonald's. So years ago, he bought McDonald's and the stock went up and then it was too expensive for him to buy. And it's just a small position. And then he, he just sold it to concentrate on something else. So that's interesting. Me, I would have held on to it, but he likes to keep a concentrated portfolio and he just sells on valuation. Another thing that is interesting is it comes out with a lot of things that are very interesting, but when he receives questions about companies, he will say that they're just on having a bit of a stay of execution. He will say that they're, they're under review. They won't just suddenly leave the portfolio. You will say he's got some reservations, they're on the watch list, and then eventually they do get moved out of the portfolio. Yeah, I think with Sage, I think over time he wasn't quite sure of whether they were developing their cloud strategy in the right way. What's interesting is how does Terry's stock picking compare to your stock picking? Has Terry done better than you? I haven't got the total access to my records, so I'm going to say that here and now, but I will say this for a fact that he has outperformed me considerably over the long term. I'm not going to try and pretend that I'm up there with Terry Smith. He has out outperformed me to some tune. Yes, he's outperformed me. He's completely trounced what I've done. I think, and with most UK small cap investors, he's completely trounced what they've done as well. The question from that is why not go all in on Terry Smith then? Why do you keep mm. stock picking? You know, why not just go all in and do something else instead? Good point. I would say that the way that I balance things now, I've got the, as I've mentioned to you earlier, I've got the three stools to the leg. I've got my own portfolio. I've got the Fundsmith and Dungeons, and I think that lets me sleep well at night. And I've got no reason to believe that anything will go disaster with Fundsmith. But you look at things that happened at Burings Bank, and you've got one rogue guy that you never know what might happen. You never know. That's So that's just me to sleep peacefully in my bed at night, that I'm happy to have that kind of division of wealth. And the other thing is, I've been doing this as you have now. I've been doing it for nearly 40 years. What would I do? What would I do? It's part of my DNA. I don't really like doing jigsaws. It would have to take up a lot of time. It's, an, it's a paying interest that's a hobby. And I think it would be very difficult for me to walk away from this. Yeah, likewise. I've mean, got the ambition, perhaps everybody who picks stocks thinks we could beat the market. We're all arrogant enough to think we could beat the market and perhaps could we beat Terry Smith? You know, looking back at his portfolio, I think if it's going to grow at 8% a year in line with the cash flow from the companies, I think maybe I could beat 8% a year. Having completely underperformed him from the last 10 years, maybe there's hope now that with UK shares or smaller UK shares, a lot of them really cheap, maybe we can outperform mm. this fund. That's what driving me on. But 
I think every UK stock pick has looked back, must be in the last few years and thought, why am I not investing with Terry Smith and just handing all my money to him and just doing yeah. something else? It's That's one of the few advantages that we've got as private investors over large fund managers is that there's nothing excluded to us. I think in Terry's Fundsmith Investing Universe, it's about 60 businesses that can look at that meet their criteria and given them the liquidity, whereas you can look at something that's got a yeah. market type capitalization of 10 million or something like that. So, you know, that's one of the advantages that we've got. You mentioned about the um, life-changing experiences. You yourself, I want to believe, if you want to expand on that. And yeah. so if you've got the conviction that I'm onto a winner, you can go, as a private investor, you, there's no limitation on what percentage you put behind it. Yeah, so my life-changing investment, or at least the one which turbocharged by wealth was London Stock Exchange. This was 20 years ago. So I put a third of my money, ended up as a third of my money into London Stock Exchange when I last purchased. And that did really well. I think that was up fivefold. So that allowed me to eventually buy a house outright, get, become mortgage free at 40. That was my conviction play. But in a fund, you couldn't put a third of your money into a fund. You've been to annual meeting. So you've seen Terry in the flesh a few times down in London. So what was your verdict of those meetings then? Because it's it seemed looking at the videos, they were busier than your typical small cap UK AGM. I think they are an excellent event. I've been to four. I was going to go to my fifth this year, but unfortunately on, on the day, we were down in the city of London for several days, basically building a, a mini break around, around Funsmith, but Terry came down with COVID, so it had to be cancelled. It was on the day of a tube strike, so it wasn't a total disaster. So I had to kill some time in the wine library at Tower Hill, so it could have been worse. But the, the last one I went to in person, I think, was in 2020. And it's at Central Hall, Westminster, so it's an excellent venue. And the, I think there were about 1,200 attendees. So I think that it exhibits how people are engaged, how Fundsmith en engage with their, it's called an annual shareholders meeting, which I'm not sure, I think that's a bit of a misnomer. I don't know where our actual shareholders, where unit holders are customers, but they call it a shareholders meeting. But you feel engaged. Terry gets up there every year. He says what's worked. He says what hasn't worked. Some of it may seem repetitive, but I never tire of it. And then they take questions that are submitted in advance. In the past, they've had extended members of the Fundsmith team there, but it's generally Terry and his two IC, Julian Robbins, who's also another excellent and economic historian. And it's it's been chaired in the last two or three years by Ian King of Sky News. It's a, it's a really excellent evening. You've had your questions answered. Are you happy with your questions? Yeah, up on, big, up, on the big, up on the big screen and having the yeah, yeah, it, 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 it's nice to see them, them. You don't know in advance that they're going to flash up, so it's nice oh. to see your name up there. And it's even nicer to have them answered. It's something you are interested in. But again, it's not just that Funsmith are just trying to do as little as they have to. Every time I've asked a question, if it's not been asked at the meeting, subsequently, I've had an, an email from Greville Ward, who's one of the partners at, at Fundsmith. It's been answered on a one-to-one. -one. So that's absolutely excellent customer engagement. Looking back through some of those meetings, a lot of the questions are about the economy and inflation and Brexit, which I think is a bit of a wasted opportunity because Terry, he never pays much attention to the economy or inflation. And he says, I don't really know what's going to happen, but if you buy good companies and pay a reasonable price for them, you tend to do all right. So I always think the best questions in these meetings are the ones about individual shares because Terry's a stock picker, isn't he? So the fund will <laughs> perform, the performance is down to the underlying companies and whether he buys good companies at reasonable prices. So the questions about individual stock picks are the best ones. You can get some insight into what he's looking at. Best question I've seen in recent years was about Facebook. The question was, why are we still in Facebook? This was 2019 meeting. Why are we still in Facebook? It feels like a business coming under attack from regulators, governments, politicians, and its own customers. Management seems to be making a lot of mistakes. What am I missing? Can we get out, please? So that's a great question. So Terry's on the back foot a little bit. He replies saying, oh, it's got high returns on capital, high growth rate, a duopoly with Google with online ads. So you get some insight into what he's thinking, but Facebook hasn't been a great investment for funds. When he was buying in 2018, the price was average of about $175 and it's recently $100. So four years later, he's lost money. And so earlier on this year, he says, Meta is the new name for Facebook. Meta stock now trades on a free cash flow yield of 8.7%. At this level, it is either cheap or a value trap. 
we will let you know which when we find out. So he doesn't know. Yeah. You think, what, is, what does Terry Smith know about Facebook? It's not like Unilever or Nestle or Pepsi, those sort of businesses. I just wonder if Terry's made a mistake here with Facebook and wherever he's stepping out of his circle of competence. Do you have a view on that, Mark? Are you concerned about the shift to tech from toothpaste? It's just to use that, that phrase tech, don't it? You know, technology, because what do we understand as technology? It's a bit of a grouping of different industries, isn't it? And I think go back to the spinning journey and the spinning limb, that would have been technology now. And we talk about things like Facebook and Alphabet being technology, or are they advertising platforms like Rightmove and Autotrader? Are they tech or are they platforms? So he's certainly drifted into it, but he's investing his, his own money al alongside mine. So I would imagine that he's got quite a bit of conviction there. And if he finds out that he's off beam, I'm pretty sure he will retreat at the earliest opportunity. I think a little bit embarrassing for Terry is that the fund holders weren't sure about Facebook a few years ago when he bought it. The question was a few years ago, why are we in Facebook? If he sells Facebook at a loss, you've got to be asking, well, hold on, we knew Facebook wasn't a good investment a few years ago. We told you. And it's not ideal. I mean, it's going to be interesting to see what Terry says about Facebook in the next annual letter because the free cash flow at that company has collapsed because it's investing a lot into the metaverse. The free cash flow yield, I think, is minimal now. So is it a mistake? Don't know yet. Not sure whether he's going to keep hold of it or sell on. I mean, he talked about Nestle and, and uh, Colgate selling because of questionable management strategy and capital allocation. Well, Facebook are investing billions into Metaverse and there's no sign of any return yet. It's interesting to see how that one pans out. I'm not convinced he knows anything about Facebook. Yeah. A couple of things there. When we talk about Terry, has got a wider team. Now, there's Julian and a team alongside them, and I'm sure he, see, he seeks their counsel. But And he has certainly changed his tune on Facebook. He quoted another Maynard, John Maynard Keynes. When the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do, sir? I'm not sure the facts have changed that much. There's another example of Amazon. So Facebook is not an isolated example. There's Amazon. So this is the 2021 shareholder meet. He says, if Mr. Bezos would flow AWS, that's the cloud computing side. If Mr. Bezos would flow AWS, we would be very interested. We don't like the idea of owning one business cross subsidizing a barely profitable business. I'm not aware there's any significant synergy between the two businesses. This is Amazon retail and the cloud computing side. It seems a happy coincidence. I just don't think he understands Amazon because the retail side of Amazon was built on what is now AWS. And Jeff Bezos saw the infrastructure, the IT infrastructure and thought, oh, it's fantastic. Let's sell it as a service to other companies. But within nine months of saying that in the annual meeting, he goes and buys Amazon stock. And you think, do you know anything about Amazon? And if you look at the price chart of Amazon, you look back when he bought in 2021, it's right at the top. $175. And then it's dropped down to a hundred cents. And you think, why has he just bought Amazon when it's gone up so much over so long a time? Doesn't really understand it. And then he buys it and it's dropped down. Mm. And you just think, does he know what he's doing? It's what I mean, you I, the, sorry, go on, Maynard. I'm trying to put a bear case here against Fundsmith. And this is the only, the only thing I found is that he's straining to tech where I don't think he knows much about Facebook. I don't think he knows much about Amazon and he's been buying these large mega cap NASDAQ stocks. Not sure why they're not exactly Pepsi or Nestle, are they? Is he straying into territory he doesn't know much about? Mm. I think he is. Yeah. It's a valid point and it's something to keep an eye on. I'm pretty sure if it does go sour, as I've said, he will change tag. You know, you've got to look against these. They are part of a wider portfolio, still aren't they? He's got 29 stocks in that portfolio. So even if one or two of them, as you get in most portfolios, underperform or do badly, it's not going to totally capitulate, is it? Yeah. There's a shift to non-dividend paying shares. Let's put it this mm. way. So when you bought, I think there was just one non-payer in the fund. Yeah. And now there's nine out of, what, 28? Mm -hmm. So there's Adobe in there, PayPal, Alphabet, which is Google, yeah. uh, a few others. So the shift of the portfolio is changing. Not as many yeah. dividends coming in. Yeah. And you think, why is that? Is he trying to, one, one suggestion is perhaps he's looking at the global benchmark and because of these mega caps have dri driven the benchmark higher over time. He's thinking, I need to keep up with the benchmark. I need to get involved yeah. in these larger companies. Well, if you look at the best use of capital, is it giving it to shareholders is it, or is it a bit better reinvested into the business to 
to compound those profits in the future. Yeah, you'd think it's better reinvested in the business. Like Google, the returns on capital are amazing in the search business, but in driverless cars, maybe not so much. Facebook, Metaverse, the return on capital is well zero or a negative number because it's not making any money. Yeah, that's the question. Just as, yeah, it'd be interesting to see what Terry Smith says in the next annual letter about some of these tech investments. Yeah. You could be suggesting that in some of these stocks is a bit late to the game, but I could say that he's just later and not necessarily late. If you're looking back to my own investment in, in Fundsmith at 164, was I, was I late there or later? And it doesn't mean that there, there isn't a lot of runway ahead of them. You remember Peter Lynch has said about Walmart and stocks like that. Big companies can keep on getting bigger. Yes, they could. They could. So yeah, Alphabet. Google, Amazon, they could all sort of 10 bag from here. But you look at the charts and you think they've already 10 bagged in the last 10 years. Every time will tell us what, what's going to happen. But So how do you monitor a funder? Do you double check the holdings all the time, what he's doing? Or do you just sit back and I, trust Terry that he's doing the right I, thing? I, I trust Terry in that. So that's what I'm paying that in that 1% for, basically. I know you've been very forensic, Maynard, and uh, rightly so, to look at some of the investments that he's got. But I've got faith in him to keep on with his track record and any energies that I've got, I'll put those predominantly into my own portfolio. Why should I keep double checking what Terry does? I look at the fact sheet each month. Has there been any outright buys or sells, any comments? I read his biannual letters and I attend the ASM and yeah, I submit questions. So that's enough contact for me. There is a risk perhaps the fund managers going off the boil. I can't, again, try to put, put forward a bear case here. Anthony Bolton years ago, he did really well, then decided that, oh, Chinese shares, I'll have a go at investing in Chinese shares and didn't do very well. Neil Woodford, extreme example, made his name investing in Glaxo and BT, then decided to set up his own fund and pick uh, smaller biotechs or unlisted shares. So changed his strategy. So yeah, I think you do have to keep an eye on what these fund managers are doing. Nick Train, another quality investor. You look at Finsbury growth and income over the last few years, it's not done very well compared to the FTSE. But has he lost his touch? Keith Ashworth Lord of Buffettology, that fund's gone nowhere now for four years. Not looking very good against the FTSE 100. You think, yeah. mm, have they lost the touch or yeah. what's happening? Were they just lucky? So again, I'm trying to sow seeds of doubt in your mind here, Mark, yeah. about, about Terry. Well, Terry said in his speeches, a fund manager cannot outperform overall market conditions. He said that from the off. To be fair, he's been saying that when he's been beating the market. He's been beating the market, but he's been laying the ground for the day and he'll come. We're behind the market for a limited period of time. Okay, there's been a bit of a pullback. We're talking that 12 months. As he says, 12 months is the time it takes the the earth to rotate around the sun. It's not a lot of time at all. The detail and clarity of purpose about what he's all about. He manages your expectations. You know, he said that, that he's not going to outperform the market. Anybody who professes that they can, it must be some kind of a snake oil salesman as, as far as I'm concerned. And another thing he's talked on this, but that is they can't market time, which I don't think people can. Now, some people profess that they can, but I don't think they can. And he said that he can't. So he's been very honest about his, what, his limitations. Yeah, to be fair to Terry, he did. He has warned about valuations. So we talked about the re-rating of his fund going higher and higher. There was an interesting question a few years ago at the meeting where someone said, what's the biggest threat to your portfolio in 2019? So this is 2019 meeting. And he said, rising interest rates, inflation for a decade and the sort of tightening of the interest rate cycle. So he was aware then that rising interest rates would put the fund valuation of the fund under pressure with de-rating of those shares. So this was 2019, so he was a bit early, but this year has seen rising interest rates and the fund derate and the fund underperform, let's say the FTSE 100. So to be fair to Terry, he has warned about valuations and he said valuations were a, or the re-rating he had since the launch of the fund was a finite and reversible source of performance. And he said that multiple times. So he has been warning shareholders that you couldn't go on forever, at least the re-rating of the fund outperformance. But at the moment, this year, Fundsmith down 14%, FTSE's up 5 the last two years, Fundsmith's up 6%, FTSE's up 22%. So you're lagging behind the FTSE 100, this dinosaur index Terry Smith has derided for years. If Terry Smith's Fundsmith stagnates for the next few years and the FTSE 100 keeps on climbing higher, what are you going to do then? Are you going to think, I'll keep backing Terry or is it time to get rid and maybe he's well, lost his touch? Yeah, we've mentioned the FTSE 100. There's a lot of stuff that I wouldn't even touch in that 
Are you going to go for the resource companies, oils companies, banks? Is that where you want your money? Or do you want it in the, the very, very defensive qualities of companies like Novo or Nord? If you've got money to spend, are you going to go down, buy those new cushion covers? Or are you going to spend it on your insulin, Maynard? What are you going to go for? Probably yeah. insulin, yeah. Medication, yeah, yeah. I think, yeah. Yeah, there's a great comfort for me that they've got a very defensive qualities. You pick any snapshot that you want. You can talk about 12 months or something like that. I see that as hardly anything at all. I'm looking at a track record, tried and tested of two decades. So I'm prepared to back that. I won't say, but I'll monitor the situation. He's bought a lot of goodwill from me and I fully anticipate to be sticking with the fund. Will you ever think of selling Fundsmith? Can you think of any reasons that you would sell some? Not off the top of my head, no. Have you sold any? I have sold very small amounts that are outside of my ISA, just to supplement to the lifestyle that I'm enjoying at the moment, but that is in very small percentage. Is there any room for Fundsmith or a fund in your portfolio? I must admit, over the last few years, looking at my portfolio and then looking at Terry's, you think, what am I doing in UK small caps when I could have just put it into Fundsmith and done something else? I've got to admit that or even like the S&P 500. Having looked at Terry Smith's portfolio now, I'm a little bit more confident because you have the re-rating benefit and the dollar benefit as well of a stronger dollar. So he didn't expect those two. Well done to Terry for getting involved in high quality stocks 10 years ago and stocks denominated in US dollars. But I think now perhaps the market conditions are a bit more favorable towards UK small caps. When we talked about City of London last time, it's got a 9% yield. On its own, 9% will beat the Terry Smith 8% growth. So I think there are more bargains around among UK small caps than, than putting all my money into Terry Smith. And the other thing is about if you put money into a fund, you're effectively saying, look, the fund manager is a better stock picker than me. Well, if that's the case, why not put all your money into these fund managers? I'm more of an all or nothing person. I'm all into UK small caps. But if I put money into a fund, I think, why not put it all into a fund? You effectively admitted the fund manager, Terry Smith, can do a better job. Give it all to him. But the other thing is you still got to monitor the fund to make sure he's not doing a Woodford and doing something he shouldn't be doing. So you still got to pay attention to it. I have thought about investing with Terry Smith, but I'm arrogant enough to think maybe I can still beat it and I'll keep on trying. I think having looked at the fund now, thinking and where the market conditions are now, Maybe I've got a better chance. Yeah, so not yet. Uh, I think the main, my main concern with Fundsmith is the shift to tech. I'm not convinced he knows about Facebook. I'm not convinced he knows about Amazon. He started buying Apple this year. And last year, he was, talked about the rise and fall of Nokia. He wasn't convinced about Apple. And again, he's changed his mind. So he's piling into these large American NASDAQ stocks and changing his mind all the time. And I'm not convinced. And the style of investment, the general sort of, paying up for quality that's worked well for years may not work as well now i think than it has done in the past so one of his latest letters he talked about justified pe's where l'oreal was at yeah. 281 times earnings yeah he that says, was in the well, 2020 ASM. he said yeah. that if you went l'oreal if you went back to 1973 you could have it could have been on a PE of 281 and still beaten the index. Yeah, I'm not convinced about that because there's a bit of sort of data mining here and his survivorship bias. And he says, if you bought, you could bought L'Oreal 50 years ago, you could have beaten the market paying a 281 times earnings. And you think, a oh, fantastic, but he's gone back and looked through all the data and picked out a, a something to justify him holding expensive stocks. I don't like that. I get the argument he's trying to put across, but... There's a bit of survivorship bias, there, hindsight bias. And what about all the stocks which looked great 50 years ago, but went to zero? Where are mm. they? So, you know, he's done really well. Yeah. I look forward to us getting to reconvening in another couple of years and you licking your wounds on this one. No, no. I think if I was going to go for a fund, I would go for a global tracker. I think that could do perhaps just as well as perhaps Terry Smith. And I wouldn't have the active manager risk. So I wouldn't be worrying about him doing a Woodford or anything like that. And I just get cheaper fees. So I'm paying a fraction of the 1% Terry charges. Yeah. And I can do something else without worrying about Terry straying into areas that I don't think he knows much about. When you look back at your Fundsmith investment, do you think it was lucky or skillful? Because it's a big investment. You've done really well. Presumably it's a one of a kind type investment. Do you, was it skill or luck or, or just a, maybe a combination of 
So I wouldn't put it down to to luck. I wouldn't say skill as much as I think it's with the research that you that I put in. I'd looked into in depth. I've listened to what he had to say. I found myself nodding. I saw the argument going alongside it. So I, I'd done the research and put a, quite a bit of conviction behind it. Because I've got to say, when you mentioned about luck, from time to time, things blow up for me. But I've got shares go wrong. And I don't put that down as bad luck. It's when I've got it wrong. It's where I've not done the research or I've not understood the business. It's generally where I've made a mistake. I would say that Gary Player says, the more that I practice, the luckier I get. So I think it's a hard-headed decision. Good. So, Mark, have I sown any seeds of doubt in your mind with my bear case against Funsmith? Well, you've tried your best, man. I'd to try and put a dampener on my holiday and you know, give me some sleepless nights. But you no, know, I'm more than happy to stick with Funsmith. As I keep saying about Terry, he's got clarity of purpose. I like the strategy and I'm prepared to stick with it for some considerable time. Well, that's it for this time. Thanks for listening to the Private Investors Podcast. If you enjoyed the podcast, please let us know by liking, subscribing, or even leaving a review. Until next time, thank you and goodbye. Yeah, I think that's all right. I can't follow up with that. This is something I didn't mention in the podcast, which I perhaps should have done. But in 2011, he said, it is becoming clear that dividends are likely to provide a more significant portion of the total return on equities in the future. How wrong could he get? Because it's capital growth since then of the last 10 years has dominated his portfolio and the dividend amount has been static at best. It's collapsed, the dividends mm. he's got from his companies because mm. he's getting involved in these tech shares which don't pay mm. a dividend. So when he launched the fund, dividends are really important. And then when you bought, he never mentioned dividends at all. Mm. <laughs> I mean, and another thing that I think he's got in common with us in that, what we were talking about is that I don't think he's got any compunction to retire at all, has he? This is this is what we do. I think he's 60, 67, 68, he looks something pretty, like that. He looks in pretty good shape. He's still sharp, sharp as a button. And you think you can carry on for another 10, 20 years, maybe. Mm. You, think. you look at Buffett, he's 90 mm. something. And he's getting old now. You can tell yeah. he's not quite as sharp as he was in terms of public speaking. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's that him. A monger's about 94 or something like that. What, what stage do you sell up? Monger's 90, he's, he's almost 100. I'm sure oh, he's... Oh, does matron say to them, come on, just go to the day room now and have a cup of tea. It's phenomenal, really, that they're commanding this amount of money, aren't they? At that, at that age. It's, it's, it's... They've always said they've got succession plans in place or something. But the thing oh. is, who's going to say to them, Warren, you passed it now. It's time for you to take a back seat. Because yeah. he won't. He's not that sort of person. He will be there until he's like completely do with Ali. Then Maynard, it's like you and I have another forty or fifty years of compounding. Can you imagine? Yes, that? yeah. I've got. I, I think I look at Buff. I look at Buffy. He's ninety, whatever. And I think right, I've got another forty years now to get. So I keep myself reasonably healthy. And I can compound my wealth. And then my son, who's nineteen, you think that well, he's got what eighty years? Maybe if he lives to a hundred, you think that eighty years of compounding at X percent. Yeah. You'll be, I mean, you'll, you'll be yeah. a trillionaire. Yeah. <laughs>